Hey, we're heading in to see Jeff Smith, Radar Golf Pro. What makes Course Kings and what makes his content that has resulted in a really rapid rise and, and following on the social media world, but has impacted golf instruction the way it has? You're going to find out on this podcast. Sitting here with Radar Golf Pro Jeff Smith here on the podcast, and we were having a conversation. We this always happens. You have these amazing conversations as you're prepping the levels, and I want to get right into that. You have. We're just going to jump straight in for our listeners. Jeff Smith has developed an unbelievable online following, a tremendous client list and portfolio. But what I why I wanted to come and sit down with you is I'm going to say you did it in a non traditional way. You didn't shortcut it. You didn't go a different way. Well, you went a different way, you, but it wasn't a less than way. It was probably a way that most people don't understand. Fair? Yeah, I 100% agree. Okay, so let's talk about building an online presence. You know, it's I, I use the word fluky. Um, being in the right place at the right time. Um, honestly, I think um, – there were things going on in social media right around the time I was really breaking into golf instruction or even a little after I'd broken into golf instruction that 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 was a reef resource that was very untapped. And so if you take Instagram, for for example, mm -hmm. you know, in most bu business dealings, when you're talking to people and you're like, hey, you know, tell me about what you do and you have a great conversation and they're interested in working with you. They're like, let me see your give me, give me your business card. Mm -hmm. And for me, Instagram was kind of my business card. I'm just doing what I do every day. I'm, I'm coaching players. I'm developing players. And the next thing you know, I'm like, you know, I thought it'd be cool if I kind of post some before and afters and things like that on Instagram. And so it started very, very basic for me. It was very like, hey, I, I liked what I did with this player. Let's put this swing up there. And the next thing you know, a bunch of people are following me. And, and did that just happen overnight? Literally. Um, you know, it was kind of Twitter was first. Okay. If you can go back to that yeah. that timeline, um, I had a Twitter profile and and you know it wasn't very well known. I think I had maybe like a thousand followers at the time, and then Instagram came along and it was a little it was a bit more interactive. It was you could put longer forms of content on there. Um, you could you could put more video stuff on there, and that's what people wanted to see. You know, people wanted were interested in golf swings and you know, putting and, you know, they, they wanted to see it. They didn't want to just read 130 characters on Twitter mm -hmm. about it. And so that, honestly, that was it. I, I started to put swings up there. I started to put before and afters up there. And the next thing you know, my DMs are filling up with, with, with players and clients. And the next thing you know, it's evolved into, I don't even, I think I have somewhere around 60,000 followers now. And I literally can't teach 50% of the people who reach out to me for instruction and I teach a lot yeah <laughs> when do. I'm at home I'm 10 hours a day mm -hmm. probably uh, on the range um, especially in the summertime even 11 12 hours a day um, I travel a lot so when I'm at home my my schedule is highly saturated and there's such a demand um, for instruction but, but what was it about your content that resonated because there's a lot of pros that put information up yep I mean it's not like you had a a twangy Scottish accent. Yeah. It wasn't like you had some, I mean, fair. It's not like you've got some bizarre swing methodology, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is a compliment. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. Yeah. What was it that resonated? Was, it was not that you were just first. Yeah, no, I definitely wasn't first. And I think it was, I was willing to go into a level of detail that people really hadn't seen before. And I wasn't afraid to do it. Okay. Uh, I was very confident in what I was saying. Um, and I felt really, really good about the, the changes I was helping people make in their golf game. Mm. And to be quite honest, my my biggest uh, calling card or my biggest um, selling point as a coach is I don't have the professional playing background that a lot of coaches have. I was not a, a college All-American. I didn't play golf at a super, super high level. Uh, I immersed myself into golf instruction the same way I'd done several other things in my life. So um, I played 
poker professional. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that. For, for yes. the time. So I've been able to take subject matter throughout my life and really dig into it and really understand its kind of inner workings and take in a lot of information very, very rapidly, filter through it, and then explain it in a way where a lot of people could understand it. Um, being able to take highly technical concepts that people would think are highly technical in yeah. a golf swing and come up with what I would consider very like dumbed down ways to explain it. I think that was, that was the thing on Instagram or social media that people were like drawn to. Right. And, and obviously I was lucky. I was very, very lucky to work with some great players. Um, I had, you know, I had a kid go on, go that I coached from high school, go to college, win the NCAAs, go on to the PGA Tour, become the Rookie of the Year. So I, I was lucky to work with very, very talented individuals. And I think it was kind of all a perfect storm of social media was advancing and adapting at a certain time. I was teaching very high-level information. I was explaining it in a way that a lot of people could understand it. And then I was getting lucky that mm -hmm. I was having a lot of great players coming to me to work with me. How did you handle the criticism? Because I could hear I, – I could just – anytime somebody kind of branches out into an area. Yep. I think what's interesting, real quick, as I say this, is that I think the top 100 evolution of golf coaches, and this is in any sport, right? We've seen it in baseball with hitting coaches and pitching coaches, that there's a, some emergence of – Online knowledge sharing, mm -hmm. okay, that has demonstrated new thought leaders. Yep. Okay, and it's really challenged the status quo. The status quo has rejected, but the status quo is getting left behind because information is currency. Sure. And it's moving people along. You had to have gotten some criticism from some people that you probably looked up to or, or felt threatened. Had yeah. to have. You know, how I handled it was, honestly, I think uh, – I was lucky. I had a good friend, Joseph Mayo, that you know well, yeah. who was kind of evolving the same right around the same time I was a, as a coach. And um, he was doing a lot of things at a very high level in the game as well. And he was advancing very, very rapidly as well. It was very similar to kind of to my story. And, um, you know, I learned some things of how Joe handled it. You know, Joe took a lot of criticism. Yeah. And some of it warranted, a lot of it unwarranted. Um, he brought a lot of it onto himself because I think that in, in, you know, Joe would even admit this early on in his career, he would take shots at other coaches because he felt like I've got the right information. They've got the wrong information and I have a need to educate. binary. Was, I need to educate yeah. the masses. It was like golf instruction was a zero sum game. Yeah. If, if I'm winning, you're losing. And I realized really quickly, that's not, that's not what's happening. That's not the way to go. And Everybody can win. I can be a top coach. I can have other coaches come to me. I can help them become top coaches. Because like I just said to you, I'm, I was fortunate to where I couldn't teach all of the people that were reaching out to me for instruction. So there was no reason for me to be defensive. There was no reason for me to, to not send clients who are reaching out to me to other coaches for help. And because there's plenty of bad golfers out there. I mean, that's yeah. just the bottom line. Yeah. There is. And so I think that's how I kind of handled the criticism. I realized really quickly, I looked at somebody like Butch Harmon, right, who's, you know, arguably, you know, a lot of people say the greatest golf instructor ever. Incredible success. You know, guy here in Vegas, everybody respects and looks up to. And I'm like, okay, here's a guy that, number one, ranked in everything, and here's a lot of people taking shots at this guy. And I'm like, well, if they're going to take shots at the guy that's number one, I better definitely be prepared to take some shots because I haven't been coaching like he has for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I haven't coached world number ones like he has. Um, you know, I don't have the resume that he has. So I, I better be prepared to take some heat. And, you know, social media is a beautiful thing that it can help you blow up and expand your business quickly. But, man, it can also open you up to every keyboard warrior out there that's ready it's gotta to be, fire off. It's got to be unbelievable, create just an unbelievable vulnerability, though. It does. I mean, does it get you on the range where you're sitting there and sometimes you're like, I mean, I know you're sitting there focused on the player. Yeah. But are there also times that you're sitting there and, and like thinking, man, if I put this out there, I'm going to get crushed or – because – Not anymore. Not anymore. And the reason for that is about six years ago – when I was really, really teaching a lot, and then I'm talking high volume of lessons, mm -hmm. 
I've always been one to where I've been my worst, own worst critic. I want to keep asking why. I want to keep finding the next level of information. I want to scrutinize what I'm doing, and I want to ask myself, is it right? So one of the things that I did was I turned my camera on on my driving range, and I just filmed myself teaching, mm. like eight hours. And I would teach for eight hours, and then I would go home at night, and I would just pop, pull out my iPad, and I would watch myself teach, and I would be like, that was terrible. That guy had no idea what you were talking about. You're using big fancy words here and it's way over his head. Or I was like, wow, you nailed that one. You got right to the root cause. You explained it super well. And so watching myself, like standing back, looking at myself teaching, I became very comfortable in my skin. I got it right way more than I got it wrong on the lesson T. But what a great skill. I think this is important for anybody who's doing what they're doing. And we do this in psychology. You go back and watch your therapy sessions. It's horrifying <laughs> because you realize your body language sucks or you're zoning out and the patient or the client's giving you information and all of a sudden you've missed it. Yeah. And what I see working with a lot of coaches is, and I'm very quiet. Anybody who's ever been with me knows I don't say a lot when I'm with a player yep. because I'm watching, I'm listening. And what I find is a lot of swing coaches, they bombard their players with information. Mm-hmm. The player doesn't know what's the most important thing. Cause you just told me four things in the last five minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm confused. And it, and I bet you saw that pretty soon. I did. And, and you know, I, I saw him like, well, you don't look very comfortable in that moment. And you got to handle that spot a little bit better. You've got you've to teach that moment a little bit better. And then experience cures a lot of things. Mm-hmm. You know, four or five years down the road, I'm standing on the range at Augusta with working with the best players in the world. I am yeah. at the U.S. Open with thousands of people on top of me with Tiger to the left and Rory to the right. And, Honestly, I was numb to all of that. I wasn't even thinking about the size of the crowds. I knew I had a player in front of me that needed to get better, that was maybe struggling. I had to get in there. I had to help him get through that moment, to play better, to play their best. And honestly, that's that's all I was focused on was the player in front of me. I know that sounds Mm-mm. crazy. No, it doesn't. But being in those moments and, and, and struggling in some of those moments and being successful in some of those moments made me – kind of be very, very numb. Did you, did you see yourself in this position? No. I, there's no way that I- anyone could honestly say that you'd be, go from, you know. You know so b- before I was in golf instruction, I had a career in retail. Okay, wait. So let's, let's, let's do a, a LinkedIn here on you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I've got an interest. I mean, I was in pharma and all this other stuff. Yeah. So tell me, um, <laughs> poor Bash, the dry skin here is getting them. <laughs> <laughs> tell me what the um, – tell me what your background was because – professional poker player because yep. I want to come back to odds and yeah. thinking in bets and okay <laughs> so let's go there yeah so you know starting back you know to my earliest golf career you know, earliest golf ages I was introduced to the game basically by my kind of by my grandfather and also by my uncle and I was probably about 12 or 13 years old you know growing up in Tennessee golf is an afterthought yeah. you know I was football baseball basketball playing all those sports and, you know, there, there wasn't even a driving range in my hometown. So we had to drive 20 minutes to go hit balls somewhere. So I started to get a little bit more serious about golf um, as I got into high school, played on my high school golf team. And I knew that I had a genuine love for sports. I honestly thought, like, basketball was my favorite sport at the time. I played football, but basketball was my favorite sport. And I honestly saw myself at 16 years old as a college basketball coach. That was like, hmm. I want to do that. I want to get into coaching basketball. And I, and I had relatives that were playing at a high level professionally and stuff like that. And so it was kind of feeding, you know, feeding that. And I kind of caught the golf bug as I was getting out of college and in, out of high school and into college. I knew that, you know, I wasn't good enough at that time to get a big time college scholarship. I knew there wasn't going to be any high level college golf for me. So I went to a really small school in Tennessee. And that's kind of when I started to get very curious about golf and golf instruction. And, uh, you know, I grew up with Joseph Mayo. and So you all grew up together? Yeah. We, well, yeah. I, I met him when I was 15 years old. Okay. So, so he's, was he your instructor? No, no, no. no. We was, he's two years older than me. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. So we yeah. grew up in the same small town, or we spent the high school years in the same small town. And honestly, he was the only other person that I really knew that was into golf and that was into it in a way. I mean, we had friends and teammates mm. on the high school level, but – not on a not in this way, in a way to where we were going to try to dissect it and break it down and read books and watch videos and go see top coaches and spend time with them. So that that all kind of started in in college, basically. Mm. 
And so I'm getting two educations. I'm learning in college and I'm digging into golf, golf instruction. So um, through that process, I kind of shifted from, okay, maybe I'm not going to coach basketball. I want to get into some form of coaching. And my wife was a college basketball player as well at the school that I went. And she was a year behind me in school. So when I, when I got out of school, I was waiting for her to finish. I kind of took a job in banking in Tennessee for a year. And uh, when she got out of college, we got married. We moved to Southern California because I was like, all right, if I'm going to really get into this golf thing, I've got to get into kind of a golf market. It's either oh, wow. Florida, California, um, Arizona. Yeah. You know, Vegas kind of was a, not even a thought at that time. And so we moved to Southern California. And I figured out really quickly, like, wow, it's tough to break into – the golf market here and I was in like LA <laughs> mm-hmm. like this isn't going to work I'm going to need to move to Palm Springs to get into the golf market so I've moved out there took a job working outside services at PGA West Moving park, carts. parking cars you know cleaning the range picking the range cleaning clubs right at the bottom like everybody else and I was I was lucky that I, I didn't know anything about Palm Springs. It was like so many things in my life around golf has been luck. And so I got a job at this course called the Citrus. And I'm setting up this range, and I'm on the back of this range, and I look up, and it's Nick Faldo, it's Lee Trevino, and it's a guy named Mac O'Grady. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't know who the hell Mac O'Grady was. All I knew was that I had to go pick the range or whatever. So I go back there, and I'm taking balls back to this guy, and I'm watching him hit shots. And it took me about five minutes to realize Lee Trevino and Nick Faldo are sitting in their golf cart watching this dude hit balls. Like, and I don't even know who that guy is. And so, you know, going back to the shop and talking to the guys in there, they're like, oh, yeah, that's Mac. You know, he's, he's a golf coach. He played on tour, blah, blah, blah. And so that really sparked just knowing him and seeing what he could do, you know, both right-handed and left-handed kind of said, wait a minute, like, might be interested to to learn more about what he teaches and and things of that nature. So never spent a lot. I never really spent individual time with Mac, but I was with a group of people who had spent a lot of time with him. And so that kind of opened some doors for me to kind of learn more technical aspects of the golf swing. And that's kind of where I got my start in, 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 in golf instruction. But curious enough, I kind of took a hiatus from it just a little bit because Around that time, living in, Cal- you know, living in California, my wife and I were about to have our first child. Mm. And when I moved to pa- the Palm Springs area, I didn't realize it was seasonal. I didn't know that everyone left. You didn't know. I mean, you were summer. ignorant. You just showed I up. I came from Tennessee. Yeah. You know, hey, there's 100 golf courses in Palm Springs. Move out there and you'll be fine in the golf industry. I got at a great club. Next thing I know, it, you know, May rolls around and there's literally – 20 rounds a day. We're doing 200 rounds a day for six months, and the next thing you know, there's 20 rounds. And I'm like, what? I'm going to go broke. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't have a child and, you know, be married and, and, and pay my bills, you know, with 20 rounds a day here, so I'm going to go broke. So I put my resume out there on monster.com, you know. And the next thing you know, I got a call from Target, a retail store, mm-hmm. retail chain, and I didn't know anything about Target or retail. I'm like, oh, wow, they're this is – this is 19, this is 99 or 2000, right in that ballpark. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, they're going to start me out at like 50 grand a year. That's incredible. And so I go to work for Target. They hire me. I run their logistics operation, which is basically replenishment for the store. And I was very, I was incredibly young. I mean, I was 24 years old, starting my, basically my first job outside of golf, making 50 grand a year. And I was like, you know what? What does is, what is the head guy here make? What's the general yeah. manager make? I want to know that. And they're like, oh, they make about 200000 a year with bonus. And in that, in 1999, 2000, yeah. that was a lot of money. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. Yeah, I want to be a GM. So I dig into my operation. I make it the best in the district. I start getting all this notoriety from these other GMs. They start moving me to these other problem stores. And the next thing you know, I'm one of the youngest GMs in Target at the time. So much. So you 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 achieved what you wanted in two years. I was in a general years. manager at at Target, and so so is that running one store or multiple stores? That's running one store. One store. And okay. Th- to give you an idea, my first store was a fifty million dollar volume store. That's middle of the road for Target, right? Mm. And so along that, you know. During that time before I became a GM, they were like, let's go test this guy and really see what he can do. So they moved me around to other markets. 
they actually moved me from Palm Springs back to L.A., where I went to work at a store in Manhattan Beach, which was the fifth highest volume Target store in the company. So it was about a $120 million store, massive operation. And, uh, you know, I killed it. And from there, it was like, okay, let's make this guy an STL, a store team leader is what they called it, a general manager. And then from there, I got to kind of pick where I wanted to go. And I was like, well, I want to go to Vegas. You know, I, I don't want to live in California. Yeah. It's too expensive. You know, my money's not, I'm making good money, but it's not going very far. Let me move back to, to, to Vegas. So I moved to Vegas and took a store here. And by this time, I'd been working with the company for about 10 years. And to be honest, I was miserable. I was making incredible money. I made I was making more per year than both my parents combined would ever make. And I was working 70 hours a week, the same monotonous routine every single day, and I was absolutely miserable, you know, six, seven days a week sometimes. And the money is what made it difficult to leave. Yeah, the golden, uh, yeah, golden you, handcuffs. Yep. You know, and you've got a young child, and you've, you're making great money, but you're just you're no quality of life whatsoever. You're working holidays, weekends, birthdays, all this stuff. And so my heart just wasn't in it. So after 10 years with a company and where I had pretty much reached as high a level as you could go, I was like, I'm going to go coach golf. Uh, so I basically walked away from a $200,000 a year salary to go teach and start at basically like $50 an hour. Mm-hmm. And I, I was lucky I had some contacts in Vegas, and some golf courses. and, and uh, But you've been away from it. For 10 it's, years. So, so studying a, it, were you studying it? Were you on? Absolutely. What was the old golf forum here, Bomb Squad? Oh, I was on Golf Works. I was on Bomb Squad. I was on, I was on basically everything. Because wasn't Bomb Squad didn't it have a huge Vegas presence? It, it did. Yeah. It did. So I, I never – I left the game physically, but I never left the game mentally. Yeah. I would say – I was really getting better as a coach when I wasn't even teaching mm. because I was, it was consuming my thoughts 24 seven technology was ramping up at that time. You know, we went from these, you know, bulky Casio cameras to now iPhones and iPads and the ability to measure in 3d. And then around 2000, 2000, I want to say 12 is when it all kind of changed for me. I had a guy, who was kind of an investor in me. He opened sort of an indoor facility in, in Las Vegas. And he's yeah. like, hey, you're a great coach. I want to put this money behind you. I want to open an indoor facility here. We're going to put TrackMan in it and everything in it, cameras, the whole nine yards, and I want you to teach out of there. And so from 2013 to 2015, I believe, is the timeline. No, it was less than that. It was like 2012 to 2014. I was teaching at an indoor facility and I was literally cranking out 15 lessons a day. And that volume of, 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 of lesson was really helping me develop as a coach. And because at that time I wasn't teaching a lot of tour players, I was teaching some good players, but most of those players were like beginning golfers. So here I am having to structure how to teach a beginning golfer and then how to teach a college player and then how to teach a mini tour player all in the same day sometimes. Mm. And I really feel like that time frame for me was, I would say that in, I would go out on a limb and say on 2013, I taught more lessons on track man than any coach in the world mm. because I had one and I had Rainer probably Shine, more volume yeah. than any coach in the country at that time. If you think about like George Gankis, who's a good buddy of mine now, that guy grinds. I mean, there's days I'll talk to him where he goes from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And I was doing that at that time. And that technology, the Doppler radar technology, understanding TrackMan, was really kind of giving me a leg up on my competition in terms of other instructors because it, it, that, that information wasn't widely known at that time, believe it or not. Yeah. People really didn't even understand simple ball flight concepts back then. And so – being being having that luxury of teaching every day with that technology and then some other technology that came about the ability to measure in 3d it kind of really that that was the timeline where i started to question everything i thought i knew about golf swing and golf instruction and previous to that how i had gathered information was going to spend time with other coaches reading books working with players working with good players like i think i've learned more from good players how to coach than probably any other influence. 
But I realized really quick there were some holes in what I was learning, especially when it related to learning from other coaches because a pattern started to exist. And, it, and that pattern was – it was even – so far back as when I was taking lessons as a, as a junior golfer or, you know, high school, college golfer, coaches were – the old history of coaching was go out and become a good player. Maybe you play yep. professionally. At some point your career is not good enough to keep going, and then you go teach, right? Yep. And what I found was that most of the coaches that I was dealing with were teaching how they played or what they felt when they were playing. Mm -hmm. And when I started to stand back and kind of analyze that and, and put it to the test from, from a measurement standpoint, so digging into track man and 3D and biomechanics and force, ground forces and all that stuff, I'm like, this doesn't pass the sniff test. This, what they're saying they felt is not what they were doing. It's interesting. What they felt is inaccurate. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And so those feelings have, have uh, created more poor concepts Mm -hmm. in golf than anything you know uh, you, you could you could come up with literally any swing flaw that comes to your mind and there's someone on the pga tour doing it right now mm -hmm. and yet there's entire uh philosophies around why you can't do that move but yet i can show you guys on the pga tour doing it yeah doing it with no problem exactly winning millions of dollars winning tournaments mm -hmm. blah 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 and so i really started to figure out so in about 15, 2015 is when I felt like I became the best version of me as a coach. Is that around the time when Instagram started? Blowing up. Blowing yep. up. Yeah. And so I, I found out, I thought earlier that probably 2010, 11, that everybody that came to me, I probably helped 30% of them. I probably made 30% of them worse, and I probably kept 30% of them the same. And it was because I was teaching basic ideology that was passed down from generation to generation by good players. It wasn't a lot of data-supported information. And so once I was able to dig into those things and punch holes in what I was teaching and, and learning from my mistakes, I felt like I got it. I figured it out. This is about matchups. Mm. You're going to have one athlete that can move a certain way. You're going to have another athlete that can move a certain way. You shouldn't have everybody trying to do the same thing because you're going to ruin half of those players and help half of those players and half of them and the, and the other third will be this they'll stay the same right and so when i figured out and really started to understand those matchups is when i felt like i was helping a hundred percent of the players that came to me completely individual completely so when if i said what's your system yep you don't have one i do not I, a very vague answer would be it's a blend of basic geometry it's a blend of biomechanics mm -hmm. Um, and it's a blend of um, two fancy words that is popular out there in the Instagram uh, world right now of kinematics and kinetics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kinetics is a, 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 a word that, that describes the forces and torques that the golfer is applying to the club that really aren't being seen, but they're acting on the club. And then the golfer will start acting they'll start moving their body in response to those forces and torque. So it's kind of like l looking at a golf swing through an MRI mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, looking at it through a, on camera is kind of like maybe taking an x-ray, so to speak. Yeah. So you, you, you have a little higher level. When you, once you have a higher level understanding of those concepts. But, but do you think – see, this is, where I, this is what I think is fascinating with you. So your career is very similar to mine. I was in a completely different world. I walked away from it and walked away at a time when everyone was like, what in the hell are you doing? Yeah. But to me it was, I'm going to say this in a, and not to sound arrogant, but I felt it could be done differently and to be done better because I felt people were missing certain things in this field. Yeah. And I felt like I came from a background and, and I want to get to your poker side because I think that's a very huge component of the way you think was my thing being a clinician was like, wait a minute here, as a former athlete and a clinician, I'm going to bring the feels that I had as an athlete, not the biomechanic feels, but the, the processes of which we train that has been demonstrated. Because my coach used to say, and, and you said it, everybody should coach like a basketball player, like a, excuse me, like a basketball coach. Basketball teams don't have free throw shooting coaches. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knows everything. It's coaching the player. Mm -hmm. And so, that was what I tried to create. And so when I'm listening to you, I'm hearing that you you immerse yourself into this, like, I've got to solve a, an issue. 
and you can't rest until you do it. Yeah, you know, I would say that my number one skill set as a coach is the ability to take in information, a lot of information at, at one time, and process that information very quickly. And from there, being able to adapt. And I've done that across many mediums in my life. Um, I wanted to become a store manager for Target. I did it mm-hmm. in almost record time. Um, when it was I a mo- formula for you. Yeah, when I moved, I figured out, okay, they're telling me, they're training me, they're saying you need to do this, 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 and this. If you do those things, you'll be successful. I learned how to do those things. I put them together. I learned how to put them together probably faster than other people did so that I was able to rise really quickly in the ranks. Um, golf instruction, you know, I wanted to really, really understand more than just positions in the golf swing. Mm-hmm. I wanted to understand motion, how motion is created, how force is created. Um, because I saw the game changing and adapting like right in front of my eyes. I saw like, wow, all these guys who are hitting the ball really far are beating everybody. So like I'm going to start with getting everybody to hit the ball very, very far <laughs> because my mind falls back into the mathematical part of it going, okay, if I can get them to hit it further, it leads to this, it leads to this. The next thing you know, we got lower scores on the scorecard. And so um, there was so many other little things that I – that I did. I mean, here's a wild story right here. Really wild story. In college, Joe and I went to the same school and we started playing volleyball. Yes. I knew there was a volleyball link in there somewhere. This is the wildest thing you've ever heard in your life. (laughs) And and, like, you can't even make this shit up to to be quite honest. Like I don't even tell the story because it's like people don't even believe it, but we started playing volleyball. We started reading books on volleyball. We started seeking out high-level coaches. And you got a girlfriend during this time, too. Yeah, she's playing basketball oh, wow. okay. at the university. Okay, that's shocking. Okay, go ahead. At the university yeah. where I'm at. And no, I'm just kidding. But freaking really good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so um, we start kind of digging into volleyball. In, in a matter of six months, we're experts in strategy in volleyball. And then we start playing. We're both pretty good athletes. Mm-hmm. Joe's big, tall, 6'5", mm-hmm. 6'6", six, six, six guy, could jump out of the gym. We started playing – the highest level of club volleyball that you could play, and we started traveling to tournaments to do it. And at that time, the professional level of volleyball was basically beach volleyball, Mm -hmm. the AVP Tour. It was out in Southern California. And I was like, man, I'd like to be associated with that. I think it would be pretty cool to officiate pro pro beach volleyball on TV, on NBC. So what did we do? Joe and I went through the certification process to get certified as – coaches or excuse me as officials we started at small um, division two level college went to ncaa division one college and the next thing you know we're both in southern california working during the summer in the manhattan beach open on tv no kidding with the best i'm calling the greatest volleyball player of all time karch karai on a net violation that is the so there's been many little things like that, that. That's bizarre. Yeah, it's unreal. Like I don't even I don't even tell these stories because people are like that's complete BS, you know. But it was just another thing. It was like it was another challenge, another obstacle, another like let's go figure that out. And you know those things have ne- I've never had as much passion in those things as I do in golf. Like this right. is this is the last thing for me because golf is such a challenge to figure out on the physical level and the mental level. And I have felt like for a while, the physical level hasn't been a challenge for me. I don't, I think, I don't think there's a golf swing flaw out there that I can't fix. Mm -hmm. And the toughest part for me to accept is that I can fix people's golf swings and they can still play poorly because of the mental side Mm -hmm. of the game. And so that leads into brutal. (laughs) Isn't it? It's, it's, it's the most helpless feeling in the world. It's unbelievable. And the reason why is because man, I've got guys who, were the best players in their generation who don't have status on a tour right now. And a lot of it is to do with the mental okay. side. So why? Um, why? If I had that answer, they'd already be on the PGA I know, Tour. But, it, it, uh, I mean, what do you think <laughs> it is? I mean, it, 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 not na- naming names. Yep. Not, you know, not anything. Yep. Um, why do you think it is, though? What, what's your inclination? I'll, I'll give you a couple of my thoughts. So I think there's, there's a number of reasons how that can happen to a yep. player. And, and I'll give a short backstory on that. Is One of the trends that I see is when really good college players come out and they get out on tour, 
the first thing they do is they look around and they see Rory and Tiger and Rom and these guys and DJ and they're like, man, these guys are really good. Mm -hmm. How am I going to do that? How am I going to get to that level? And so they start thinking, I need to start changing everything that I do. They start adding all these people in their circle and they start changing all these things. And the next thing you know, they're going down a golf instruction route that isn't going to change the way they play whatever. And it's actually going to erode at the DNA that got them to the level that they're at. Mm -hmm. And I tell this, I tell people this all the time and I'm dead serious about it because I've lived it. And I live it every day is that every time, if you're working with a high level player, that's gotten to s some good level of golf, every time, time you change something in that player's game be swing putting mechanics short game mechanics there's a cost there is a cost associated with that change and it, when I, when I'm asked to work with a PGA tour player for the first time and I assess them the first thing I ask is what's the fire that's burning down the house if there is one and that's typically who's coming to me yep. the best player in the world is not coming, not to, coming Jeff to you Smith, yep. you know um, the guy that's 200th in the world that's about to lose his card if he doesn't figure something yeah. out it needs to come I'm still to me. waiting on the guy who said, I've won three times this year. Can you help me? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, he's not, he's not coming, no. so I stopped waiting. But um, you, you know, just to touch on that, you're like – sorry, I completely lost no. my train of so, thought. There. So it's, it's what's, the opportunity, what's the cost? It's okay, like the, the cost, right. Yeah. So I look at this player, and I'm like, okay, here's the fire that's burning down the house. This needs to be changed, and what's the return on investment here? Because I know it's going to be a painful change, mm -hmm. but this guy, if he can make this change, it's going to, A, financially change his life because he's going to be from going from 200th in the world to I think this guy can be a top 50 player in the world and potentially win on the tour. So the return on investment is very, very high for that individual. So you can move deeply, you know, you can move quickly into that change. And it, it, some guys... You know, I'll, I'll give you, like, Aaron Wise, for example, mm -hmm. comes out PGA Tour Rookie of the Year, wins as a rookie, and has unlimited potential. I believe that he can be a top 10 player in the world. He believes he can be a top 10 player in the world. And after his rookie year, and he had all the success, right after the Tour Championship, he was like, let's go to work. i got to get better. i got to become a better iron player. i got to do this. i got to do that. I need to change this in my swing. And so... I was very hesitant, very, very hesitant. And I saw I saw glaring things in his swing that limited his potential as a ball striker. And that's basically what we were trying to, to, to work on was the ball striking. But I knew it was going to come at a cost. Well, what was the cost? It was a sophomore season on the PGA Tour where, you know, he's never in jeopardy of losing his card. He's too good to do that. He's going to win over a million dollars. He's going to make the playoffs. But it, the expectation is how do you follow up a season with, that you won on as a rookie and you're the rookie of the year? It's got Your second year has got to be better than your first year, especially in everybody else's mind, right? Yeah. So that's that whole, he, you know, these are the conversations that I have with my players. Mm -hmm. And these, I, I put it all out there. I don't want to force changes on them. I want them to know how difficult the change will be. I want, to know, I want them to know what the, the, the cost of that change is going to be. I want them to know what the upside of that change is going to be. And then at the end of the day, they'll, they'll weigh it all out. We'll talk about it, and then we'll put a plan together if they want to move forward. And there's nothing wrong. Like, I give lessons all the time. I gave one yesterday. A kid came to me, and he had one of the sickest golf swings I've ever seen. Like, very little bit unique if you looked at it on camera but the functional matchups in his swing I'm like dude I spend all year long trying to get people to swing like you've got right now that you he this kid never had a coach really hmm. he just figured it out he's kind of like Dustin Johnson you know genetic lottery yep. here and I'm like buddy if I'm going to be your coach my primary goal is to preserve where you're at how am I going to do that? I'm going to document this. I'm going to document it in video. I'm going to measure you in 3D. I'm going to collect this data, and then we're going to use this as a template so that if you ever get off and you're going through a bad – because this guy wasn't playing bad. Mm -hmm. He just came to me because I was famous on Instagram or He's whatever. He's got access. He can get He's here. got access. He came here, saw me, and I, he was literally startled. We sat down, and, and I told him, I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to explain to you in this lesson. We've got 90 minutes how your golf swing works and why it works. And he was like startled. We sat in the golf cart and talked for 20 minutes and he's like, 
We're not going to hit ball. We're not going to change anything. What about my backswing? What about this? You know, I'm like, dude. So I start showing him all of the best players in the world that have these physical characteristics that he has. And I'm like, we need to go look at the other parts of your game. If you're not achieving what you want to achieve right now, he's going to Notre Dame next year as a D1 college golfer. I'm like, if you're not achieving what you want to achieve, you're not winning the tournaments you want to win, we need to dig into the other parts of your game and find out why because it ain't because of your golf swing. But isn't it – I mean, making those changes and taking an Aaron Wise, yeah. okay? The freshman year, it's, yeah, looking around, but I'm going to take what I got. I don't have any expectations. Right. Then all of a sudden you do all this work and the patience drops, the expectations rise, and people get frustrated. Mm -hmm. And then when that confidence waxes on them, now all of a sudden – there's a whole new crop coming in, and and the old dudes are out there, still out there. I mean, your Piercy's, your guys that you look at, and you're like, well, I mean, physically, these young kids should be lapping the field of them. Yep. But yet, you you said the key word there, confidence. Yeah. And I never really understood what that meant before. Um, I got to be honest, I was incredibly skeptical of sports psychology growing Good. up. I should thought be. to myself, man, this is a bunch of shit. Yep. You know, it is. I can have all the confidence <laughs> that I want. You right. put me behind the, the you put me behind the 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 controls of a 747. It's going in the ground because I don't know how to fly the thing. I right. can be confident as I want, but it's going in the ground. And I and I looked at athletes the same way. I was like, the guy's swing's terrible. That's he doesn't it doesn't matter how much confidence he's got. He don't know where his golf ball's going. Like right. his swing is bad. Let me fix the swing. So I never really understood the confidence p part until. I saw really good players who had great swings go through rough patches of performance and lose confidence. And I was like, there it is. That's mm -hmm. the difference. This, this rookie over here, this guy just won on the, on the web.com tour last year. And the year before that, he won in Canada. And the year before that, he was NCAA champion. This guy is brimming with confidence. That's why he's crushing it as a rookie. And now all of a sudden, he's in his sophomore year, and he's not winning every other tournament like he thinks he's going to do, and the confidence starts to go down. And I notice a pattern. I'm like, what? Now the guy's second guessing everything. What's what's wrong with my putting? What's wrong with my chipping? Yeah. What's wrong, you know, wait a minute. We were only working on your ball strike. We were only trying to go after these metrics associated. At the end of the then year, then they start we, looking at other Instagram stories. Of and course, they start, yes. So they're that, talking to so and so at lunch. So that was yeah. my that was a revelation for me of like, okay, this is how confidence manifests itself. It's People being very protective of what they do already, mm. the, them really understanding what they do at a high level. Um, when I say being protective, I mean not allowing a lot of outside influences to come in there and tinker with things and change things or being sold on, hey, if you'll do this, you'll be a better player if you do this. You know, confidence is someone who's, you know, who's got ability. Now look at all these young kids like the Matt Wolfs and Colin Morikawa's and these guys and they're just dominating in college, so guess what they're going to do as a rookie? They're confident. They're confident. You know? And that's – there's something to be said for those three guys. To be quite honest, if you look at Victor Hovland and Colin and, and Matt Wolf, I watched all those guys play in college, and I never thought, like, yeah, they're all three going to come out and they're going to win as rookies on tour and win all this tournament. I, I wasn't really that impressed. You know, in college, they were good and they were winning. It's Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, but I see. He was a good athlete. Now he's an M NFL MVP. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and so like that freedom that they played with and that energy and excitement for the game, it wasn't polluted or corrupted yet. They hadn't really. Is they it hadn't because experienced they're not, any failure? Is it because confidence? See, to me, confidence is I can handle whatever comes my way. That's ultimate belief. Yeah. To me, the 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 cycle is belief is at the greatest point. Confidence feeds belief. Trust feeds b confidence. A plan feeds trust, and a vision feeds a plan. What do you want? How do we build a plan to get there? How do we start seeing trust? How do we start building confidence that it can expand? And then belief is, I can handle any storm that comes my way. Yeah. So a player goes out there and goes, I didn't have it today, but I'm okay. I'm going to do some work. Versus the player who doesn't have it goes, I didn't have it today. Why in the hell is it falling apart? Why am I continuing this trend? Yeah. That brings me to the poker part. Because what turned me on to poker, and I don't play poker, was a book by Annie Duke, Thinking in Bets. Have you read it? Yeah. I, no, but I, I've actually met Annie a few times and talked poker with her. Okay, read the book. Yeah. But that's what she calls it resulting. She said when people have a failed experience, they want to go back and change their process. Yeah. 
when really it's just statistical. That's 100%. it. So do, is that how you kind of a, so address the, the big draw for, to poker for me was the parallels between that and golf, and especially golf instruction. I mean, they are absolutely one in the same. Every time you're playing a hand, there is a, there's a, mouth, there's a mathematically predicted outcome based on a lot of information, right? And you can play your hand exactly perfectly. You can get all the money in the pot with the best hand as a 70-30 favorite, and you can lose. And you because lose. 30% of the time, that guy's going to win. Because if it didn't work that way, it's we, not personal. we couldn't have poker games. Right, it's not personal. All the good players yep. would have the money, and all the bad players yep. would be broke, and there'd be no poker games. That's right? why World Series of Poker is always a new guy. Sure. And so – the thing about you have to ask yourself is, man, I got this guy to put all his money in the pot with only a 30% chance of winning. I did my job. I increased my mathematic probability of winning money. Hmm. And so I do the same thing in golf instruction. When I look at a player, I'm like, how do I increase this player's mathematical opportunity to shoot better scores? So it's not a zero-sum game there. Correct. Isn't that where a lot of people make a mistake, though, in golf performance? Is it is it's either a win or a lose? It's not, yeah, exactly not. Okay. Hey, last time I checked, you get a big check for second place too. Yeah. You know, Scott Pierce, he finished second at Oakmont in the U.S. Open, and I remember the check was over a million bucks. <laughs> I was like, well, that's you just won more as a second place finisher than all your other wins on tour. Yeah. And he was like, wow, that's that's true. Yeah, but I should have won. <laughs> yeah, I should have made more putts. I should have made more putts, right? <laughs> and, because then that what we like, that's what she t- calls resulting is like. Man, I should have played that hand different. When statistically, it just happened. Yeah. True. All right. Let me ask you this. And we'll wrap up on Sunday afternoon here. Um, I know you probably get asked, and if any young coach of any sport, any young entrepreneur, any young business person is listening to this, I want you to listen what the path really is. It wasn't get a job, learn, solve it, be famous in your job by 28. Now, you did it at Target, but that wasn't your passion. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was, I was very successful in pharma. It wasn't my passion. I'm not saying everybody needs to chase their passion because there are a lot of people out there doing things that maybe they can't afford, but (laughs) I'm sure you get asked all the time by young instructors and they're on the hunt to be the best that they can be. Yep. I would say that the vast majority of the people I give the recommendations to don't follow them. Yeah. Okay. But I want to give you the chance now to say, look, if you do to any instructor out there, any coach, baseball coach, basketball, do these three things. And you'll grow your presence, yep. whether it's Instagram, your lesson book, or just your respect among your peers. Because you've, yep. you've done all three of those. So what would yep. it be? Um, I would first say, you know, if, if we're talking to golf, we're talking to golf coaches. Yeah, here. let's go to golf coaches. Yeah, so if we're talking to golf coaches. I would say, number one, um, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid to call up a successful coach that you know and ask them if you can spend time with them. Do not be afraid of turning the camera on and expressing your viewpoint and your thought of why something is the way that it is. Um, Don't be afraid to take on that high-level player and be be afraid to to, to get in there and dig dig in there and help that player. Like, that's one of the things I see... Not, not knocking any coach on the PGA Tour because I think that they're out there for a reason. Mm-hmm. But I see it all the time to where a, they're working with a good player and they're afraid, afraid to change it. They're afraid of getting fired. They're yeah. afraid that they may make that player there. play worse. I've been there. And I just, you, I just have never operated that way. How? And I've never operated <laughs> that way because of the self-reflection. I've filmed myself. I've watched myself. I've looked at my information. I've critiqued my information. I've admitted I was wrong in information. I evolved from that wrong information. I continued to seek out better ways and still continue to seek out better ways to do things. So I'm not, af- I'm not afraid. I also established that I'm also not afraid to tell a guy, man, this is as good as you're going to do it. This is as good as you're going to swing the club. Let's go find other avenues to be more successful than you are right now. That's, that's one of the things that I have ever – I've never watched another coach work with a player and go, you don't need a lesson. I've never seen that happen. Have you? Mm, not I've many. never seen that happen. Nope. And I do it pretty frequently. Mm. I'm known for full swing mechanics, so most of the people that seek me out on Instagram, they're like, I want to go see him about my swing. I literally have people that will come to me with phenomenal world-class golf swings, and they 
think they want they think they need to change their golf swing and then i take them over to the chipping and the putting green and it's terrible yeah and, and i'm like you're missing it here you're, you're missing the whole the, the objects to shoot the lowest score and you do something incredibly well and you aren't accepting of the fact you do it well and you and you're not going after these other pieces that are basically holding you back and so my message to those coaches was would be the biggest thing is don't be afraid it's very hard because most co- coaches, a lot of coaches, and, and the reason why I'm speaking from experience is, is I have coaches come from all over the world here mm-hmm. to see me. And that's kind of one of the things I'm known for is, like, I don't think I've ever told anybody no. Yeah. I don't even charge them. You want to come shadow me? You want to come watch me teach all day? I don't care if I've got Scott Pierce here, Aaron Wise, or this college player. Come on and watch and see what I do. And I, I feel like that's my obligation to do that because I was lucky to be around a lot of very smart people. Um, Guys like Grant Waite and Mike Bennett and Andy Plummer and Sasha McKenzie and all these brilliant, you know, PhD level biomechanists who didn't owe the game of golf anything. And they just said, okay, I'm going to start doing research in these fields. And they were shedding light and, and, and ideas and information on topics that has been over the top of golf pros heads for forever. And so, like, I feel like I'm kind of the embodiment of all those influences, and I've been able to reach out to those people and ask them questions. I mean, I'm calling these guys at 11 o'clock at night on a, on a Saturday going, what, tell, let's talk about this, mm. you know. Help me understand this better. And these people have been able to share their time with me. And so I feel like that's my obligation to continue doing that because when I first broke into the golf industry, that didn't exist. Mm. Golf pros, for whatever reason, were very territorial. Like, they didn't want you coming to their course. They didn't want you coming to their range. If they sniffed that another coach was on their range teaching a lesson, they were all over them. It was just they didn't want to teach in front of crowds. They didn't want to teach in front of other people. It was like it's all out of insecurity, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and so, absolutely. And, and so there's so many people out there who aren't like that anymore. You know, the, the the Andrew Rices of the world, the James Ridyards of the world. These guys are out there just sharing information on social media and, you know, and, and things like Coach Camp and just all these different places, mm-hmm. bringing all these people together. So there's so much sharing of information out there that it's you can do what I did, which is elevate very quickly because you had now have access to so much information. And I think, like, when you look at my story and you go, this guy – went from retail golf to teaching on the PGA tour in, you know, a matter of 10 years. Like that's not even possible. How did, how did that happen? Well, it, in my opinion, that wasn't possible 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you weren't introduced to a tour player, a relative of a tour player, you weren't getting out on tour. It was a good old boys network or club. And now I've taught tour players because of Instagram. I've had winners on the PG. I've had major champions come to me because they saw videos I put on Instagram. That's craziness mm-hmm. when you think about that. And so that's what's available to coaches now. And 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 my advice would be just take advantage of it. It's it's out there. Dig into it. Yeah, I was at Coach Camp. I was talking to Andrew Rice about it, and he's like, "Just you're and and I completely agree with it. You're gonna screw up your videos. Yeah. But if you don't get the marbles out, they ain't getting out." There's not going to be a better time. Yeah. There's not going to be a better format. There's not going to be a, you know, and that it's funny. It's kind of, I didn't start it with the video, but it was like some of it was just sharing information. I mean, mine was Facebook. Yep. I just started sharing information on Facebook and I was like, that's not how it goes. The key is find the medium that you're the most comfortable with. And, and here's what I mean by that. When I started course Kings and I started to create the library of videos I wanted on there, nothing was ever good enough. It was like, nope reshoot that i don't like the way that came out i'm sitting here scrutinizing myself i'm scripting these things i'm writing them out and the first 20 videos that i made for course kings i was like "Mm -mm, i'm not doing this this is terrible i'm stumbling through these i'm babbling i sound like an idiot like i can't read from scripts that's not me i'm like i know that feeling put a student in front of me turn the camera on you just walk around filming me and i'm gonna start so you do everything you do everything with a with a student in front of you. I, it's kind of evolved to that now. Yeah, you're more comfortable there. I'm more comfortable. Yeah, I get and that. I give a better lesson and I give better information. Yeah. If I just stare I'm looking in. At Brett. I'm looking at Brett while we're talking because this is what's interesting. You know, if you said turn on the camera for me and said 
dive into a, a psychological skill set. I'm going to try to do it as if I was back in my residency training and I was getting <laughs> grilled by my professors. You put a whiteboard in front of me and you ask me a question, I'll diagram it up on a whiteboard yeah. in three seconds flat. And it's, I can hold a line. It can be coherent. I don't care what the camera looks like. I don't care that I'm overweight. Yep. I just want to get the concepts across. Because honestly, when I'm on the lesson tee and I have a student in front of me, I'm oblivious that the cameras yeah. are even rolling. I'm just like, okay, let's yeah. fix this. That's how I am. Here's how I communicate. And the next thing I know... I look back at it after it's been ed edited, and I'm like, wow, that comes across very easy to understand. I got all the points in yeah. there that I needed to do. And it, I'm not sweating bullets and, and stressing out and take two, take three, and doing all that. I, I pretty much And I bet you that. never worry about what the cycle is of what you're speaking on either. No. Because, see, if somebody says film, and I'm sitting there thinking, intro, meet, closing. But if, if you said, hey, tell me about how to break – well, I, I do how have to break a, down confidence. I'd be yeah, there it is. I do have a basic structure yeah. for how I you teach have a every lesson, yeah. and I follow that, and, and it's very, very, very simple. But I tell you what, it did free me up to do was when, when, the idea behind Course Kings. When I created it originally, I was like, "Will this thing get old? Will this play out? Will I run out of content? Like I don't know anything about this, and I've never been at a loss for what to shoot next. I shoot whatever the lesson, whatever the lesson is that day." And there's so many different golf swings and so many different things that, that you're changing you, on a daily basis. I'm going to ask you a logistics question. Yeah. Do you have to ask your student? Do you mind if I put Absolutely. It? Okay. I, I do that at a common courtesy and yeah, respect. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, hey. But here's the thing. They're reaching they don't out care. to me. They're coming from all over the world. I'm like, hey, I'm gonna, I've got six lessons today. I'm going to film two of them. I've never worked with you before. Do you mind if I do that? And they're like, yeah, let's do it. They're honored. You know? Because they found you from they, yeah, that they, same way. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, and, and here's the really cool part about it <laughs> is – a lot of students, when they come to you, and they they're like, "Hey, can we make some notes? Can you give me a little video recap?" I give you I give you the Course Kings video. Yeah. Take that thing home, and like here you go. You're not going to get a better recap than this. And they'll sit right. there and rewatch this lesson over and over and over. And yeah. so it, it it serves double purpose. <laughs> it's it, what I what I take from that is, and a little bit, of, and it's kind of the insight for me is, screw what the standard is. Yeah. Do you? That's all you can do. And that's what you did with Instagram. You can't be somebody that you're not. You're going to look yeah. like a fool if you're out there trying to do that, right? Yeah. If you, somebody's trying to be right off golf pro, they're going to fail. I don't know. I'm a pretty basic guy. They could no, probably no. do that. No, if you but, got, if you want to try to be – so Gigi's a close friend of mine. Yeah. You want to go try to be Gigi, you're going to look like an idiot. A total idiot. He's one of a kind. He's authentic. And he's as real as it gets, and that's the thing that I He'd respect about him. He'd be like the coolest him. high school science teacher. Oh, no doubt. I mean, just think about how fun it is to be coached by somebody like that. Yeah. Like, growing up, my football coaches were hard asses. My baseball coaches were not fun to be around. My basketball coach was a nerd. It's like I would have loved to go on and, and, and take lessons every day with, with a guy like Gigi. It's at least, I might, it's at least going to be fun mm -hmm. every single time, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's, that's what, one of the things I respect about him is that he is who he and is. And he knows who his client is, too. Yeah. I mean, but his it, client's going to be somebody who embraces and likes that versus somebody. But it somebody. doesn't even matter. No. It to does. him, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, he could be giving a lesson to Butch Harmon, and he's going to do it his way, right? Yeah. Um, he could give, you know, he could give a, a lesson to a president, and he's going to be standing there on that range probably in flip-flops, <laughs> a flat bill hat, you know, and using his terminology. Right. And it's, it's authentic, and that's who he is, and it's, it's really cool. It's just, that's the only way you can do it, in yeah. my opinion. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, I love Thanks it, man. I appreciate out. you coming Absolutely. all the way to Vegas. Oh, yeah. Heck, yeah.